Hey guys, what's up? It's Eric with Advanced Level Automotive. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another quick video. Today, we're taking a look at this 2009. It's an Infiniti FX35. It's got the V6 3.5 liter engine. And the customer complaint is that uh, the engine is running rough. Intermittently, it will stall. Uh, they're telling me that sometimes when they go to make a hard turn, like a hard left or a hard right turn, uh, the engine wants to stall. So um, there is a check engine light is what they're telling me. Um, you guys already know how we do it. Let's get started. All right, so moving inside the vehicle, let's go ahead and start this thing up and see how it runs. So I'm gonna hop in and it's a push start. So we're gonna go ahead and put our foot on the brake and start this thing up. You guys can hear the engine is running. And if we take a look here, uh, we actually don't have a check engine light at the moment. So I'm looking here, I don't see the check engine light. Uh, the engine is running so far, it actually sounds okay. I don't hear any misfires, but uh, let's go ahead and let this idle uh, come down okay so our idle has come down you can see that we're sitting somewhere around 650 rpm which is normal and so far the engine sounds pretty good i don't hear any misfires i don't feel the engine shaking there's no smoke coming out of the tailpipe um, at this point in time everything seems pretty normal again we don't have a check engine light right now but that doesn't mean that we don't have maybe a code stored in the engine computer so um, that's probably the next thing that we should do is go ahead and pull a scan tool out, connect it, and see if we have any save trouble codes. All right, so I've got my scan tool connected. I'm just using the uh, YA101, very basic, simple scan tool, just to do a quick um, code check. So we're going to go into the diagnostic menu, and you can see we do have one DTC count. So let's go ahead and go back and read the code and see what code we have. So stored codes, and you can see we only have one of one code and that code is a P0024. So P0024 says here camshaft uh, position timing over advanced or system performance bank two. Well, this really doesn't tell us a whole lot about the code. So I think what we need to do next is go ahead and pull up a code description and see if we can get some more information from that. All right guys, so I switched over to my other scan tool. This is my launch X431 Pro 3S Plus. And uh, the only reason I switched over to this is because well, basically we can do a code search on the internet. So let's go to engine. Let's read fault code. And there we have our same P0024. As you can see, it is the only code that we have present at the moment. So let's go ahead and click on this code search. And what this is going to do is it's going to basically Google the internet and uh, hopefully we can pull up a code description. So here we have um, Google. And if we scroll down, Let's see if we can find a legit website. I think this one is good right here, autocodes.com. I tend to like this website a lot because it's pretty straightforward with the basic information that you're looking for. And so here, again, you can see our P0024 Nissan code, exhaust valve timing control performance bank two. So right away, we know that essentially this code is dealing with the exhaust valve timing control and it's on bank two. So let's go ahead and scroll down and it gives us here a list of possible causes. It tells us that uh, we could have a faulty exhaust valve timing control solenoid valve, which is pretty common on a lot of vehicles, you know, especially if they don't maintain their oil changes. Sometimes those solenoids can get gummed up with a bunch of crud from old oil. And so you can have the valve mechanically sticking. So that's something that's pretty common. Uh, next up, you can see it says exhaust valve timing control solenoid valve harness open or shorted. Of course, that's a possibility. Then we have the other possibility of exhaust valve timing, control solenoid, valve circuit, poor electrical connection, of course. Then it tells us here we could have a faulty crank position sensor or a faulty cam position sensor. So, you know, I guess this code is pretty straightforward. Um, it tells us here, gives us a tech note, since the exhaust valve timing control solenoid valve uses oil flow to control timing, Dirty oil can cause the valve to stick, open, or close. Before replacing the valve, change the engine oil and filter and reset the engine code. So, like I said before, you know, these things are common to happen um, whenever you have a vehicle that really hasn't been maintained that well and the engine oil is really dirty, or maybe it has low engine oil because low engine oil can cause low oil pressure. And of course, these valves and all of the VVT mechanisms work off of oil pressure so a lot of times that's the first thing that you want to check whenever you run into a timing code like this so i think that's the first thing i want to go ahead and do let's move under the hood and check the oil all right guys so check this out i've got the hood popped open and i came over here to pull the dipstick out which you can see is 
located right here in the center. And uh, the first thing that I noticed before even pulling the dipstick out was how much corrosion we had on the engine. Look at the timing cover of the engine. You see it's covered on all of this white kind of crud. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of oxidation for an engine to have. Now take a look at some of these bolts. Look at the bolts on the timing cover. Let me zoom you in a little bit on there. Look at how much rust we have on this bolt here for the sensor. These bolts over here, I mean, this stuff is completely oxidated and rusted. You know, that got me thinking whether or not it's a possibility that this vehicle has been in a flood. If you guys didn't know, down here in Houston, Texas, we have a lot of flooded vehicles, especially after Hurricane Harvey hit back in 2017. So there's a lot of these flood cars on the market. And so if you guys are planning on buying a car from down south, you know, there's a lot of things that I think you should take note of before actually buying the car, because some of these flooded cars, um, you know, they didn't go through the insurance. They kind of flew under the radar. And so sometimes you might pick up a car, you didn't know it was flooded. And these things can have all kinds of electrical problems. I mean, just take a look at the amount of rust. Look at this hose clamp right here. You can see it's completely rusted. Look at all this corrosion on that throttle body. I haven't even taken this cover off. I mean, look at this mass airflow sensor. Look at the bolts. They're all corroded. Look at these grounds right here, especially the grounds because these are so important. And when they're corroded like this, they don't make a good connection. That can lead to a lot of electrical issues. And there's a lot of different grounds on this engine and on the body. Again, look at this mass airflow sensor over here. You can see it's all corroded. I mean, the only way the bolts up here get corroded is from moisture up here or the water level being so high that it actually reached a certain point to where it got to these bolts right here. I mean, take a look at the frame here. You can see these strut mount bolts are rusted. I mean, all of this stuff is corroded. Oh, you can even see here on the frame, look at this rust. You guys see that? They couldn't even put a bolt back in through this hole because this whole frame here is rusted. So yeah, guys, let me pop open this fuse box and see what it looks like in here. All right, so there's our fuse box. I mean, it doesn't look too bad. This is just one of the fuse boxes. There's uh, two other fuse boxes over there, I believe. So this is where the battery is located. Yeah, so we have this fuse box right here. Let me pop this cover off. There we go. Uh, so these fuses look okay, but there's another fuse box back there, which is called the IPDM, and that's an actual computer module. So you definitely don't want water getting into that. And if it did, that's going to cause all kinds of problems. And I'm curious to see what's underneath this cover. It's got these uh, five bolts. So let me go ahead and take them off and we'll get a good look at it. All right, so I went ahead and I took the nuts off. Let's go ahead and pull this cover off. Yeah, you can definitely see how much corrosion we have. Look at this timing cover here. I mean, look at this fuel pressure regulator. Look at the rust on all of these nuts on the lines. I mean, geez, this thing has a ton of corrosion. I mean, I don't think there's one little bit of steel that isn't corroded. Look at the hose clamp on this EVAP. I mean, that hose clamp is completely rusted. I mean, take a look at all of this dirt here. It's possible that could have been road debris, you know, being picked up over the years, but, you know, taking a closer look at this, this definitely looks to me like this was from flood water. I mean, look at these clamps on this air box. They're rusted. And again, taking a look at these grounds, these are actually really important computer grounds and coil grounds right here on the timing cover. And you can see these grounds right here. These are all very important grounds. Just look at how much corrosion we have on these things. You know that's definitely not making a good connection. And these are just the grounds that we're able to see. There's plenty of other grounds that we can't see that are probably just as corroded. All right, guys, so this is not looking good already. I feel really discouraged because if you guys didn't know, I have a long history of working on flood cars and I hate it. I mean, if there's anything I don't wanna work on, it has to be a car that's been underwater, especially if it's been underwater for a significant amount of time. And it definitely looks like this one was underwater for quite a while. And so, you know, I'm getting to the point where I'm not even sure if I want to continue with this vehicle. I might just have to call the customer back and, you know, give them my opinion and then probably just have them come pick up the car because I don't know if I want to get involved with another flood car. I've been down this road plenty of times and it's not one that I want to take again. You know, I'm not saying that it's something I can't fix. Of course, you know, anything can be fixed, but at a certain point you have to decide whether or not it's worth the time and the money to fix it. 
and every time I get involved with one of these cars, it always ends up costing a lot more money than the customer thought it was going to. I end up spending way more time than I anticipated. In the end, everyone loses and nobody wins. Now I'm probably still gonna go ahead and check the engine oil. You know, hopefully they didn't just recently change it because if they did, then, you know, that's not going to help us at all in this diagnosis. But, you know, I guess we could check the engine oil because Again, this really only has one engine code stored, and that's that P0024. And of course, it being a code for the variable valve timing, um, it is possible that we could have an issue with maybe the solenoid sticking, and uh, that's what's causing our rough running issue because when those solenoids stick, sometimes the timing will stay advanced or retarded on one bank and then that'll cause the engine to run really rough and in many cases stall. So let's go ahead and pull the dipstick out and take a look. All right guys, so hopefully you can see the dipstick. If you look right here, this dot at the bottom is going to be the low dot and the dot up here at the top is going to be the high dot. And if you look, you can see right in the middle where our oil line stops. So we're definitely a little bit low. I would say maybe about half a quart low. Not low enough to where I would be, you know, really concerned, but it does need about a quart of oil. Now, another thing to look at when we're looking at the engine oil is going to be the color. If you look here, you can see that we have a nice dark brown color. Uh, doesn't look like the oil has been changed recently, um, but it does look like this oil is probably due for an oil change. Now, I wouldn't say that this looks like it's been neglected at all because it doesn't look that bad. So I'm not too concerned about it. However, I would definitely recommend to change the oil and the filter. By the way, if you guys are curious where the VVT solenoids are located on this engine, uh, this side over here is our bank two side, the uh, driver side and the passenger side is going to be our bank one. Again, our code is indicating that we have a problem here on bank two. And if you look right down here, you can see where the solenoid is mounted. It's actually mounted uh, from the bottom up. Let me see if I can shove the camera down in there and give you a good view of it. Okay, so there is our VVT solenoid, this thing right here. And this is the bolt that holds it on. And it extends into this timing cover housing and you guys can see that it is completely corroded and rusted. And so I wouldn't be surprised if this thing was malfunctioning. Now you can see where our connector for the solenoid is right here and it's actually still connected. But like I said, there's tons of corrosion here. Now taking a look at the other side, you can see that we pretty much have the same thing going on here. So I'm gonna point it out to you. It's right over here. This is our VVT solenoid. It's sticking in kind of sideways into this housing here. But yeah, if you look at the connector, you can see the connector here. And this is the solenoid itself. And again, look how corroded it is. And then there's another ground that we have right here. Again, a very important ground. And just look and see how much corrosion we have on those bolts. This ground is completely corroded. And so is this one. Now, if you have a vehicle and you're thinking that maybe it's been in a flood, but you're not sure, one of the things that you can do is look up under here and look at the firewall and you guys can see this corrosion on this uh steel plate right here and up there where the brake booster is and all this corrosion on all of these brackets you know that's a good indicator that we had some water get up in here and that water got pretty high another place that you can check is actually underneath the seats now this seat is actually kind of hard to see under because it's got this plastic cover but if yours doesn't have this plastic cover, take a look at the seat rails. If the seat rails are rusted, or if the motors underneath are rusted, then the car definitely has been underwater. One other thing that I just noticed, and it's a dead giveaway, if you guys take a look at the seats, you can see how much mold we have on the edge of the seat. So take a look at that. That's all mold. Look at the other side over here. You see all of that? That's all mold and mildew from this truck being underwater. Sometimes you might even notice a water line on the door. In this case, I don't see a water line. It may have already been wiped down, but you can see that door speaker there. Looks like it's got some dirt up in that grill. So I'm pretty sure the water level got up pretty high. In this case, you can see where we actually have some mold up here on the door panel. So not only do we have it on the seats over here, but we have it on the door panel as well. These are all surefire signs that this car has been underwater. Now, the other thing I can't show you on camera is the smell. Even though the carpet has been dried out and the car no longer has any water inside of it, you can still smell that distinct odor of the mildew. So at this point, I'm 100% sure convinced that this car was underwater. Now, like I said, I'm not really sure if I'm going to continue with this car, 
but I am going to at least take it for a test drive. I'm going to look at some scan data and see if we can figure out exactly what's going on with this VVT fault. All right, guys, so before I go on a test drive, I want to take a quick look at some data pids just so that we have a better idea of what's going on here. Uh, now, one of the things that we could take a look at um, is this exhaust VT learn. This is the uh, variable valve timing exhaust learn. There is a procedure in the scan tool that needs to be done if you ever go in there and replace any components uh, to where you have to relearn the exhaust valve timing. Um, if it has not been done yet, it'll tell us here. So let's go ahead and hit OK. And you guys can see our exhaust VT learn has been completed. So we know that we don't need to worry about that. Let me back out and deselect it. Um, because now that we know that that has been learned, we don't have to worry about it. Uh, next up, I'm going to scroll down and show you the other two data pids that I have selected. Uh, here we have the intake uh, valve timing for bank one and the intake valve timing for bank two. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at both of these. You can see that we have uh, zero for both right now. And I'm going to accelerate the engine and you'll see that our numbers are going to move. You can see we're up. We got up somewhere to around 20. And now that I'm holding it steady, you can see that we're back down to about zero. I'm going to let off. And you can see we stay around zero. Now, what we can do is actually graph this. So I'm going to hit the graph mode. And you can see we have our graph side by side. So bank one, intake valve timing, and bank two, intake valve timing. Again, this is for the intake. This is not for the exhaust. So what I'm trying to do is give you a comparison between a working system and a system that has a problem. So this is a working system. And what you're going to see is as I accelerate, we have this sort of spike in the graph. You see the spike happen right here? Now I'm holding it steady. And you can see the graph right here is kind of leveled out. Now I'm going to let off of the accelerator. And you can see that we're pretty much steadied out somewhere around zero. We did have this spike here on both sides when I first went to accelerate it, but then it came back down to zero. Now, what I want you to notice about this is that both of these graphs match each other. What's happening on bank one is happening on bank two. They both move together. And so what I can even do is I can actually combine the two graphs. Let's hit combine here. And you can see that our orange line and our blue line pretty much match each other for the most part. And so I'm gonna go ahead and rev it up again and take a look again, our initial spike. Now I'm holding it steady. And you can see it's leveling out right here. Now I'm gonna let off. Again, you can see it holding it steady. Again, that initial spike, it got somewhere up to about 20, 25 maybe. Um, but the important thing here is that bank one and bank two match each other. They're moving together. Now let's go ahead and back out and let's deselect these. Let me scroll down here. We're going to deselect our intake and then we're going to locate our exhaust. So I think I skipped it. Let me scroll back up here where is our exhaust there it is our bank one exhaust valve timing and our bank two exhaust valve timing so i'm going to hit okay and we're going to take a look at our numbers here again just looking at this while it's idling we're seeing zero but watch what happens when i hit the accelerator so i'm going to accelerate you see we had a jump here but i don't know if you noticed there was actually a difference between the two numbers so let's go ahead and graph these. It may be easier to see it on the graphing mode here. So I'm gonna go ahead and rev it and take a look at what happens here. So we have our initial spike and you can see that it's trying to kind of even it out over here. We kind of have the same thing going on over here, but you can see there's this difference between the two graphs. Now I'm gonna let off. And again, take a look at these two graphs. You can see that we kind of had a spike on both of them and we had this dip, but look at what happened over here. We had this come way back up over here. And if you take a look, we got to somewhere around 25 with this secondary hump here. And on this one over here on the secondary hump, we only got to about 15. And so I'm gonna go ahead and combine the two graphs. So we'll hit combine and take a look at these two graphs on top of each other. This does not look good. So I'm gonna go ahead and rev it up again. Take a look. You'll see that initial spike where they kind of follow each other. But then look how much of a gap we have there to where they separated. And now they're kind of coming back down towards zero over here. So they're kind of leveling off right here. Now I'm gonna let off. 
And again, it's staying down here around zero. But again, take a look at this graph here. I zoomed out, sorry about that. Um, so take a look at this graph and you can see that there's definitely a difference between what's happening on bank one and what's happening on bank two. Now, for a reference here, bank one is going to be our blue line and bank two is going to be our orange line. And so what the computer is telling us with the P0024 is that we have a problem with bank two. So the computer doesn't like what it's seeing here. And so that could mean we have a problem with either a solenoid or maybe a sticking uh, VVT valve um, or a VVT component. And so in this case, you know, this doesn't tell us exactly what's happening, but it does give us an idea as to what the computer is looking at and why it set the code. So what I want to go ahead and do is I want to take this thing for a test drive because like I said, guys, at the moment, this truck is running just fine. We don't even have a check engine light present. I don't have any misfires. The engine is not shaking. It's not smoking out of the tailpipe, nothing like that. And so what I want to do is I want to drive this thing and see if I can get it to start acting up. And then we're going to take a look at the scan tool and we're going to see the data and hopefully we can catch something. All right, guys, so I'm on a test drive. Sorry, I've got the windows open. Again, <laughs> the smell. So anyways, I've got uh, my scan tool right over here on my seat or on the passenger seat. And I'm just gonna take this thing for a drive to see if it starts to act up. So far, it's driving good, but I've only been driving for a couple of minutes now. And so I haven't really run into any issues so far. It's got a lot of power. It's got plenty of power. So, uh, so far, everything looks good. Let me drive this thing around for a little bit and uh, see if I can get it tacked up. One hour later. All right, guys, so I've been on this test drive now for over an hour. Um, I had some errands to run, so, you know, no biggie. I just uh, brought some stuff with me that I needed to uh, return to the auto parts. And so, you know, running back and forth, the truck never seemed to give me any problems. I mean, I never had any instance where the truck wanted to stall. The engine ran fine. I didn't have any misfires. I mean, the only thing that I could say is that uh, there were sometimes moments of hesitation when I would go to accelerate, but it was never anything, you know, major. And so at this point, um, I'm not really sure what to think. You know, I guess what I was hoping is that, you know, I could recreate the problem and then I would be able to see on the scan tool whether or not that problem was related to our timing. Because um, what I was hoping to see was that when this engine would start to act up on the scan tool, I was hoping to see that maybe one of the two banks, bank one or bank two, would be stuck either retarded or advanced. And then that would give me the proof that I needed to say, okay, this problem is timing related. Of course that didn't happen. The truck ran fine. And so at this point, I'm not really sure if I can recommend replacing anything at the moment because uh, quite honestly, I don't think that replacing the VVT solenoid is going to fix anything because uh, now that I remember on this design, the solenoid itself that I showed you guys earlier um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that only controls the intake valve or the intake valve timing. The exhaust valve timing is actually controlled by a magnetic piece inside of that cover that's bolted to the timing cover. Hopefully I'm explaining that correctly, but let me see if I can pull up a diagram or a picture of it so I can show you guys what it is I'm talking about. All right, guys, so I've got all data pulled up on the screen. And what we're looking at is the code description uh, for P0014 and P0024. EVT control codes. Now these two codes are related to each other. Essentially they mean the same thing, but for different banks. So the P0014 is for the bank one and the P0024, which is the code that we have, is for the bank two. Now if we scroll down here, I'm going to click on this. Uh, this is going to give us some more information. So again, if you look at the P0014, it tells us it's for the exhaust valve timing EVT control performance of bank one. And then of course the P0024, which is the code that we have present, uh, it says exhaust valve timing EVT control performance for bank two. Now, if you look here, the DTC detecting condition, it tells us that there is a gap between angle of target and phase control angle degree. Now, if we look over here, you can see that we have some possible causes. Uh, first of all, we have a crankshaft position sensor could be a possible cause, camshaft position sensor, EVT control position sensor, EVT control magnet retarder, which is one that's really important. We'll get to that in a second. Um, accumulation of debris to the signal pickup portion of the camshaft, uh, timing chain installation, EVT control pulley assembly. Now, the reason I mention uh, the importance of the EVT control magnet retarder 
is because I actually have run into this before in the past, and it's actually a pretty common problem with these Nissans and Infinities that use an electric uh, magnet to control the variable valve timing of the exhaust cam. Now, when I say this is a common problem, I mean, take a look at all data here. I'm gonna take you guys to the home page, And what I noticed here down on the uh, bottom right-hand side of the screen where it says community repairs, uh, one of the first ones that pops up here is about malfunction indicator lamp reported with code P0014 and or P0024 runs rough. So I'm going to click on this right here and I'm going to show you guys um, that this is actually a pretty common problem. So if you look at this uh, diagnostic bulletin, it gives us some information about how the system works. Um, it tells us that the ECM sends on and off pulse signals or duty cycle signals to the exhaust valve timing control magnet retarder. And this makes it possible uh, for the timing of the exhaust valve to increase engine torque and output in range of high speed. So it's some pretty useful information, but if you scroll down here, um, they do tell us about possible causes. And again, this EVT control magnet retarder is a very common problem. And so if we scroll down here, you can see that we have some technical uh, hints. It tells us here on this hint specifically that some technicians have reported that the magnetic gear portion can wear, causing the air gap to increase or become uneven, causing these codes to set. They're also mentioning the EVT control retarder part of the front timing cover. So this EVT magnetic retarder is built into a cover that's bolted onto the front of the timing cover. I'm going to show you guys a picture of that in a second. There's a picture of it here, but it's not a very good picture. So I'm going to scroll down real quick and I'm going to show you guys um, there are some verified fixes from quite a few people. Uh, you can see here that they uh, said a great bulletin made finding the solution so easy. We had the same DTCs, P0014 and P0024 on a 07 Infinity G35. Replacing the exhaust cam magnetic retarders fixed our problems too. And again, there's another one down here. Uh, this guy says for a 2011 EX35 all-wheel drive, P0014 and P0024 set, uh, tech inspected, found the EVT control magnet retarders faulty, replaced both assemblies, cleared the codes, road test to verify, and fixed. So when I say, guys, this is a common problem, it really is. I mean, so much that there's actually a technical service bulletin directly from Nissan about this problem. So I'm going to switch over and show you guys that there's a technical service bulletin but the interesting thing about this is if you look at it, the technical service bulletin says it only applies to 2009 through 2012 Nissan Maximas. Now, I'm not sure why they're saying this only applies to the Nissan Maxima when there's a multitude of different Nissan and Infiniti vehicles that use the exact same engine with the exact same design. And so I can scroll down here and show you, but essentially um, what this bulletin is telling you is to go ahead and replace the left and right cylinder banks exhaust valve control magnet retarder. And so when you have this P0014 and P0024, according to this bulletin, the action is to replace both of the exhaust valve control magnet retarders. Now let me show you guys what it looks like. So if I switch over here, this is a picture of what this cover looks like that contains both the EVT magnetic retarder and also our variable valve timing solenoid for the intake side. So this cover right here, if we flip it around, you'll see the inside of it. And if you look right over here, you'll notice that we have this uh, piece that protrudes. So what this part is for is it actually gets inserted into the intake cam. And so this variable valve timing device right here, the solenoid, which is like I said, you see typically on most vehicles where the VVT is controlled by oil pressure, that's exactly how this works. So this solenoid extends into this housing and it controls the amount of oil flow and that's what controls the variable valve timing for the intake cam. Now when we look over here to the left, this circular piece right here is what is called the exhaust valve magnetic retarder. And so what this is, is this is much like an electromagnet that you find on an air conditioning compressor clutch. And so this is basically a magnetic coil. And if you look right down over here, you can see that we have some wires extending out toward the top of the cover here and then it connects to this blue plug that extends to the outside of the cover and so the way this works is that the ecm is going to supply a voltage and a ground and that's going to energize this magnetic coil here and it's going to work with the cam phaser on the exhaust cam to advance or retard the timing and so if we switch over here we can see um, the piece of the phaser that's on the exhaust cam now, if we look at it on the engine, you can see right here 
Um, this is where the cover gets bolted onto. So once we unbolt and remove this cover, you can see this is our intake cam here. And you can see the hole in the center. That's where that nose that protrudes from the cover uh, gets inserted into right here in the intake cam. Because like I said, this intake cam is controlled by oil pressure and oil flow through the VVT solenoid. But the exhaust cam is not controlled by oil. The exhaust cam is strictly controlled by that magnetic retarder coil. Now moving back over to this technical service bulletin that, like I said again, only applies to the Nissan Maxima for some reason. I'm not sure why they're saying it doesn't apply for other vehicles. If we scroll down here, what they're telling you to do is replace just the magnetic coil part. You can see our magnetic coil right there. What they're instructing you to do is actually remove it. This magnetic retarder comes with a piece of paper that you actually cut up into pieces and then you use that paper uh, to slide inside of this ring right here because there's actually a spring clip and so the paper um, i guess you put it in four different spots and that's going to disengage the clip in order for you to be able to remove this magnetic retarder you can see how they're pulling it out of the uh, housing there and then you can see where this magnetic retarder sits inside of the housing and then you just install the new one reinstall the harness clip it back into the connector there and uh, you're all done now the problem is is that this bulletin it's pretty outdated and you guys are going to find it very difficult to even be able to locate anyone who has these magnetic retarders. And so if you look up here, you can see that in the parts information of the bulletin, uh, it tells us exhaust valve control magnetic retarder kit. And it gives us a part number here. You guys can see the Nissan part number. And that is for each individual one because you can see the quantity is for two. And so Nissan originally decided that the fix was to just go ahead and replace the magnetic retarder by itself. However, nowadays, if you try to find this part, it is very difficult to get a hold of. I've looked online, I've called the dealership. The only way they want to sell it to you is complete with the cover that includes both the magnetic retarder and the variable valve timing solenoid. When I got a price for this thing, it was around $900 for each side. And so I started doing some research and digging, uh, trying to figure out why Nissan no longer wants to sell you just the magnetic retarder by itself. And some of the information that I found was a little bit uh, kind of vague, but essentially what they were telling me is that uh, this cover can actually sustain damage from the magnetic retarder part. So what they're saying a lot of times is that just replacing the magnetic piece doesn't always fix the problem because the cover itself could be worn on the inside. And so I think at this point, Nissan decided to no longer offer just the magnetic retarder by itself. Instead, now you have to buy this entire piece. And like I said, it's about $900 and that is retail cost. I know list cost is somewhere around $1,000. So these things are not cheap. So at this point, I am gonna have to talk to the customer and let them know um, that the part that we're recommending to replace is gonna cost about $900. And you know, on the other hand, I was able to find this magnetic retarder by itself online, some old inventory that I was able to find on a website, but to be honest with you guys, um, I'm kind of weary about doing it that way because, you know, this retarder is still about $300. And what if I replace just the retarder and it still doesn't work? There's a problem with the cover and the fix would have been to replace the entire cover to begin with. And now they're already $300 in the hole because I try to save them some money. And so sometimes when you do this, you know, for a living, you kind of have to decide whether or not it's worth it when you're trying to save people some money. You know, maybe if it was your own car and you were doing it yourself and you just couldn't afford the entire cover, then yeah, in that case, I would probably recommend it's worth a try. But if somebody's paying you to do it and they expect some kind of warranty, I wouldn't mess around. I would just recommend to replace the entire cover so that you know you're gonna fix it right the first time. All right, guys, so one quick check I wanted to do. Um, I actually found a resistance specification for the magnetic retarder. So if you look down here, you can see um, I unbolted it so that I can get to it a little bit easier but on pins one and two i've got my two leads connected here on the terminals and i'm doing an ohm measurement using my lab scope here um, now if you take a look um, the measurement that they're specifying is between 9 and 11 ohms of resistance you guys can see we're at 10.5 ohms of resistance so we're well within specification now you know just because you have a good resistance measurement on a magnetic coil doesn't mean that the coil is still good you could still have a bad coil especially if it's an intermittent problem like we have 
you know, it may have something to do with temperature. Maybe once the temperature of the engine gets hot and then that magnetic coil gets hot, that's when it starts to act up. So in this case, me seeing this, you know, doesn't tell me that the coil itself is good. Then again, like I said, a lot of technicians, what they're saying is that the cover itself actually gets worn. And so it causes a gap between the magnetic retarder and the cam phaser itself. Too much of an air gap is going to cause issues with the magnetic clutch engaging with the cam phaser. So just because you guys see a good ohm measurement doesn't mean that the part can't still be bad. Anyways, guys, at this point, I'm going to end out the video. Um, I spoke to the customer. I gave her an estimate. And as you guys can guess, she wasn't very happy with the amount of money it was going to cost to fix this vehicle. Um, so naturally, she declined. Um, that doesn't mean that she's not going to want to do the repair in the future. Um, but right now, with the holidays and everything, it's understandable that, um, you know, not everyone has the money to drop a thousand dollars um, to fix a flooded vehicle on top of that you know i let her know that of course it being flooded this truck is going to continue to have other problems electrical issues now i may actually do a ground cleaning on all of those grounds that you saw on the engine block so i'm going to do that before i deliver the vehicle to her um, but at this point we're really not going to go any further with any other repairs now, if she does decide to do the repair in the future, I will do a video on it and I will update you guys. I'm sorry that I couldn't give you like a full conclusion. I'm hoping that this video can still help you out. Maybe you were able to take away some useful information. Hopefully you learned something that you didn't know before. But like I said, as far as a complete fix, I just can't give that to you guys right now. And then quite honestly, I'm actually a little bit relieved that she didn't decide to replace the part because you know a part of me kind of doesn't want to get married to this vehicle like i said before guys i've dealt with a lot of flood cars in the past and i'm kind of over that part of my life i don't want to get married to another vehicle and putting a thousand dollar part in a truck like this that's been underwater you're definitely going to get married to it anything that pops up in the future as a result of what you did or even things that you didn't do, a lot of that stuff is gonna start coming back on you to bite you in the rear end. So in a lot of ways, I'm kind of relieved that I don't have to fix this truck. Anyways, guys, like I always say, thank you for watching the video. I hope you find it useful. I hope you find it informational, educational, entertaining. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell. And hey, I'll see you guys next year in 2022. By the way, I do want to say thank you for all of your support throughout the past year. You guys have been awesome in supporting the channel, always being there to watch all of the videos that I put out. And so I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Next year, 2022, I'm planning on putting out a lot of good content for you guys. Hopefully you'll stay tuned for that. Like I said, Happy New Year, guys, and I'll see you in 2022.